Again, any uh, injects from the sermon today or any thoughts? The feeding of the 5,000. Um, all right, I have a couple thoughts on Pastor Bob's passage towards the end there. Verse 14, the people saw the sign he had performed. They saw this specific miracle, and they said, surely this is the prophet. Why, why did they think of the prophet that they were expecting from this miracle? I think they could see that God was with Okay. Okay, so it definitely has to do with Moses, right? Bob touched on this because Moses in Deuteronomy 18, 15, I think, Moses is the one who predicted the prophet who was going to come and he was going to be like Moses. And so what's one thing that happened under Moses that was similar to this? Manna, absolutely. God fed the Israelites, and all they had to do is go pick it up. Think of how easy that was back then. I was going to look these numbers up. I totally forgot until right now. But um, today, it's something like one farmer feeds 180 people or something like that. One farmer feeds like 180 people. Back then, it was something more like 80 farmers fed 100 people. So just the workload of producing food to survive was astronomical. God provided them food in the, in the wilderness. Here, oh, here's a guy who's providing us food out of nowhere, out in the wilderness. He must be that prophet like unto Moses. So keep that in mind. That's going to be important later on today as well. And then verse 15, Bob talked about this a lot. Jesus perceived that they were intending to come and take him by force, and Jesus withdrew by himself. So I have a question. Where were the disciples? Why didn't Jesus withdraw with the disciples. They were his close friends, his only friends. What do you think? Anybody? <laughs> Maybe busy picking up fragments. They've already finished that. The people want to make Jesus king right now. Jesus sends his disciples away. He sends the people away. He goes up by himself to pray. To pray. Why? Why aren't his disciples there with him? Why does he send them away too? Well, I think we're going to find out later today that I think his disciples were part of the crowd. His disciples wanted to make him king right then too. And, of course, that's a theme all the way through the Gospels right up until the garden where they're coming to arrest Jesus and Peter whips out his sword and he's ready to fight for an earthly king. So I think the disciples were right, right there with the crowd, and Jesus had to get away from everybody. His disciples were not allies at that point. And he sends them away, and we're going to see that a little bit more later today as well. So, John 6, chapter, or, uh, verse 16. <clears throat> now when evening came... His disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. And it had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. And the sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. When therefore they had rowed about three or four miles, they beheld Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened." And he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. They were willing, therefore, to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. What else happened immediately, according to the other Gospels? 
The sea was calm. The wind was calm. All right. So, be a skeptic with me for a minute, okay? You, the Apostle John has handed you some writing, okay? And he says, friend, I want you to read this. And he tells you the point, Jesus is God, okay? I want you to read this. So to prove it to you, these are the stories I have to demonstrate that Jesus is God. So you're a skeptic, and you, before you dive in, you, you develop a checklist that says, okay, if John's going to convince me that Jesus is God, I need these things checked off, okay? And some of these checklists, some, some of these items in the checklist are in bold, okay? These, you say, absolutely have to be checked off for Jesus to claim to be God. And then there's other ones that are just normal font and you'd like to have them checked off. It'd be nice. You think they add weight to the argument that Jesus is divine. Um, so help me out here. What are some of your what if, what are some of your bold items like John has to demonstrate this for Jesus to be God? Okay. It has to be a lot of witnesses. Okay, a lot of witnesses. Miracles. Miracles. Miracles in general, I think. That's the one I had down as an example just in case nobody participated. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> okay, miracles in general, absolutely. You have to, if Jesus is going to be God, he has to demonstrate that he can do things that humans can't do on their own. All right, how about a nice-to-have? What's something that you'd like to have checked off that maybe doesn't necessarily have to be there? Anybody? Jim? A backup to the previous. Prophets never err. They never make a mistake. Always perfectly ready. Okay. All right, so I put down for... Um, for kind of those nice-to-have items, I said, claims to be God, okay? It'd be nice if someone who was supposedly God claimed to be God, but it wouldn't be required, right? And we see in, in uh, the other Gospels that it's, you have to read between the lines to see that Jesus is claiming to be God. So, now, how about the specific miracle of walking on water? You think that specific miracle... Let's say in our culture today, that specific miracle, is that something we have to say, we have to see this for Jesus' claim to be God to be intact and complete? Yeah. It's a bonus, I would agree. In today's culture, it's, it's a bonus. Well, back then, it wasn't a bonus. Okay, this is a big old divine check mark on the bold part of the list walking on water, and we're going we're gonna to delve into why today. So very much required back then. And the reason is, the sea in general uh, is this symbol at that time of chaos and evil in the world. It's not that they thought the sea was actually evil, but the sea uh, and nature, storms, are a symbol of evil and chaos in the world, um, not just in the Jewish religion, but in all of the ancient Near Eastern religions. It's easy to see why, right? The sea is powerful. It's unpredictable. Um, we, we can build these little wooden fishing boats, and we're not safe on the sea. It's uncontrollable. And it's interesting that all of the ancient Near East creation accounts from different religions, they all have three things right at the beginning, including ours, okay? The sky is there, the sea is there, and the earth is there prior to creation. And the, the sky is not seen as threatening. It's just this canopy. In fact, they believed that it was a solid dome over a flat earth. 
So the sky is not threatening. The earth, that's not threatening. I plant my garden in the earth. I get life. The earth sustains my life. But the sea, the sea is dangerous. The sea is powerful. And so it became a metaphor in, in all those ancient religions. Um, for example, here's the Babylonian creation account. It's called the Enuma Elish. And in it, one of many gods, Marduk, okay, he conquers another god called Tiamat. And Tiamat is the god of the sea, the god of the ocean. Okay, and Marduk, it's a, it's a long convoluted story, but the gist of it is Marduk goes, he slays Tiamat, cuts her in two. By the way, he uses the wind as a weapon in this. He uses lightning as a weapon in this. He slays her, cuts her in half, and then Marduk creates the sky and the earth out of the two halves of the sea that he just conquered. And Tiamat is set up as this evil god. She's, she's out to kill all the other gods at the time that he does this. Okay, so having done that, having conquered, Marduk then reigns as the supreme god, having overcome the sea. He rides around on his storm chariot, and like I said, he uses the winds and lightning as, as his weapons. Canaanite religion, Baal, conquers Yam. Guess what? Who's Yam? The god of the sea. Interestingly, what's the Hebrew word for sea? Yam. Yam. Okay, all these, these the cultures are very closely intertwined. They're all right there in the same geographical area. Um, and so they share a lot of, of stories. Again, and then God, Baal is set up then as the god of rain and thunder. And he reigns a little differently as the lord of heaven. Okay, but he still is, requires help from other gods to do things. So, oh, the other thing I forgot to mention there, um, these sea gods, the armies at their disposal are sea monsters and Leviathan. And we'll see here in a minute that in the Bible, both those things are associated with the sea as forces of evil and chaos. So what's the Israelite response to these cultures around them? Um, well, well, we'll start at the beginning here. Genesis 1. The Spirit of the Lord hovers over the waters, right? The earth was formless and empty. It's, it's the Hebrew word tohu. It's, it's chaos. It's wilderness, wildness. The Spirit of God is there. All that exists already. And then what does... What does God do with that? Boom, he creates. He subdues the chaos and the evil, and he creates order and life and goodness. Okay, in interestingly too, um, Marduk, he uses the blood of the God that he killed to create human beings to be the slaves of the gods to provide them food and service. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yahweh, what does he create man as? He creates man in his own image, as his image bearers on earth. Okay, so even the Hebrew creation account starts out with God overcoming the sea and chaos. How about in poetry? You don't have to turn with me, but I'm going to read through some scriptures here. Think of the, well, you'll see it, the theme of all these passages. Psalm 93. Sorry, that's first on my list. I'm just going to go in order here to save time. So this would be Job 26, 8 through 13. Job, this is Job talking to uh, Bildad and rebuking him, talking about God. He wraps up the waters in, the, in his clouds. 
The cloud does not burst under them. He obscures the face of the full moon and spreads his cloud over it. He has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are amazed at his rebuke. He quieted the sea with his power, and by his understanding, he shattered Rahab. Rahab is another word uh, used in parallel with Leviathan a lot, so it's a sea monster term, basically. That's one. Next one, Job 38. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who enclosed the sea with doors? When bursting forth, it went out from the womb. When I made a cloud its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band. And I placed boundaries on it, and I set a bolt on the doors. So here's God claiming to be the one who conquered the sea. Psalm 65, 6 and 7. Who does establish the mountains by his strength, being girded with might? Who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, and the tumult of the peoples? The peoples, uh, nations are, are called the sea in the Bible a lot. And when evil nations are raised up to come and punish Israel, they are, they are spoken of as coming up out of the sea. So again, a symbol of evil that God reigns above. Psalm 74. This is a good one. 12 through 17. Yet God is my king from of old, who works deeds of deliverance in the midst of the earth, who did divide the sea by his strength, who did break the heads of the sea monsters in the waters, who did crush the heads of Leviathan, you gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You broke open springs and torrents. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours is the night. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have established all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. So here we have God overcoming the seas, crushing the sea monsters and the Leviathan, Okay, these aren't, we're clearly not speaking of created, like our earthly creation beings here that God then went and killed. Obviously, he could do that. He created them. They're metaphors from the day for chaos, for evil. And then what did God do? He established the day and the night and the seasons, and he brought order out of this turbulent mess. A couple more here. Psalm 89, 6 through 10. For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty is like the Lord? A God greatly feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is like you? Your faithfulness also surrounds you you rule the swelling of the sea when its waves rise, you still them. You yourself crushed Rahab like one who is slain. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. Last one here. Or nope, next to the last one. This one is uh, Psalm 89. Nope, Psalm 93. Sorry. Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord has clothed himself, girded himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods has, have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves. More than the sounds of many waters, more than the mighty breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. The Lord is displayed as this God who overcomes the sea. Isaiah 27.1. Here's uh, Isaiah kind of goes back and forth between you guys are going to be punished, but there's some hope. This is 
the deliverance of Israel. And that day the Lord will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, with his fierce and great and mighty sword, even the Leviathan, the twisted serpent, and he will kill the dragon who lives in the sea. And it's promised to Israel of a future time when God is going to do these things, when he's going to put chaos and evil to bed for the final time. And it doesn't stop there. It goes right on through with New Testament authors. And I'll just give you one quick example there. It's uh, Revelation 21. Revelation 21, 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. Now, he could be talking about a new earth with no sea, but by far more likely in my mind, he's talking metaphorically. There's going to be a new earth with no chaos, no evil, nothing unpredictable that can overcome us because God's going to be there with us. And so that's the promise for the future as well. So you can see the Israelite response to all their cultures is, no, the one who is over the sea and the chaos and has conquered that is who? Yahweh. He is the one. So, Jesus comes walking on the stormy sea. He's walking on the stormy sea. The wind and the waves, they're straining at the oars to get where they want to go. Jesus walks across. Who is Jesus claiming to be as he walks across the Sea of Galilee in a storm? God. He is claiming to be divine. He is doing a divine act. He is not doing an act that men do. And as we'll see in a minute here, he's not doing an act that ghosts do. He is doing a divine act. What's the disciples' response? Fear. Fear. Here's Jesus doing a divine act, and they are afraid. So, to the Israelite reading this story, Jesus is very clearly claiming here to be, where this story sets Jesus up to be, Yahweh, the one who conquers the sea. Who's he set up to be to John's wider audience? to the Babylonians and the Canaanites and the Greeks. I think their god of the sea was Neptune. Who is Jesus set up to be? Well, divine at the very least, right? Divine because he has power over the sea, power over chaos and evil. E evil. So do the disciples get it? Not really. They're, they're afraid, right? And then turn over to Mark 6 with me real quick. So, yeah, the disciples don't get it, and Mark, Mark makes this a little more clear. Verse 49, we'll start there. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were frightened. They thought he was a ghost. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were greatly astonished. They were greatly astonished. Here's Jesus, who's been attempting to reveal to them his divinity, and they are astonished. For they had not, why? Verse 52, for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves, but their heart was hardened. What was their heart hardened to? <laughs> the, 
the reality of who he is. They've already, and get this, get this, they have already confessed. Who did Nathaniel in chapter 1 confess that Jesus was? The Messiah, the Son of God. They have already confessed that. They are following him because they believe that he is the Messiah, the Son of God. But what are they refusing to believe? That he's divine, that he's God. They are not, they cannot believe that. And not only that, back to John 6, 15, Jesus runs away because they want to make him king. The disciples want a Messiah in their image. They have their idea of what a Messiah is going to be. The Messiah was prophesied to be a prophet or a priest or a king or some combination of those. And what did Israelites glom on to? A king for sure, because we want to be saved from the Romans or the Babylonians or whomever. We want to be saved. Our Messiah is going to be a king, right? And they fail to see the complete picture by design, by God's design. Paul says that in uh, 1 Corinthians. But the disciples refuse to believe. And I have a uh, paper here. If you're interested, you can have this copy, or I can make you more. This is... uh, was published in the Journal of Biblical Literature back in 2008. It's an article on the Mark passage. Why, why does Mark emphasize the fact that they thought it was a ghost? And then he, and then he uh, says their hearts were hardened. Well, he says this. It was absolutely absurd to think that it was a ghost walking on water. Okay, because the culture of the day, all, all of the myths legends, stories, everything had very specific entities walking on water, divine entities, divine men. They were the men that walked on water. We have yet to find today any story from ancient literature where there is a ghost who walks on water. In fact, quite the contrary. All of the stories and the ghost lore of the day, if you will, says that they are afraid of water. They're bound by water. People who died at sea were feared lost forever unless special provisions were made. And so seafaring communities would build these things that would allow the ghosts of sailors to come out of the water and onto land and be safe. (coughs) But that was a special provision. And think about Hades. How are the souls in Hades in Greek mythology held there? What keeps them there? A couple of rivers, right? The river Styx is the famous river from Hades. There's a... um, Most of this is highlighted in here. There's a legend where there's a ghost terrorizing a village. And a hero comes and he rescues the village. And how does he defeat the ghost? He drowns it in the sea. So... What this guy's trying to say, Jason Robert Combs is trying to say, is that it, is ab- it was absolutely absurd for the disciples to see a being walking on the water and think it's a ghost. But here's his conclusion, and I'll read it to you. In Mark, the disciples' insistence on believing the absurd seems to emphasize to the extreme their failure to believe in Jesus. It forms a striking narrative portrayal of cognitive dissonance. The disciples clearly want Jesus to be something he is not, to the point that they are willing to believe the absurd when he approaches them on the water, rather than something much grander than they had ever imagined. Gods and divine men walk on water. Ghosts do not. But when the disciples see Jesus walking on water, they believe the impossible rather than the obvious. That's how badly they wanted that earthly king and that earthly kingdom. Again, it's a 15-page 
read that's a little dry, but if you want it, there's a lot of interesting information in there. So that's why I go back to, to chapter 5, 15. Jesus goes away alone. It's because his disciples weren't with him. They were not on his side, Harold. Consequently, we didn't understand. We didn't grasp what was going on. Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely, there's some personal introspection that needs to happen there. Okay, and we'll get to that here a little more. Possibly, yeah. I, I agree, um, but it's clear that Jesus is leaving people here who are trying to make him something he's not, okay? And he, yeah, he goes off by himself, but here he's about to separate himself by, a, by the Sea of Galilee from his disciples. So I see something more unique here, and then combined with the, the account in John and Matthew where the disciples' hearts are hardened to the reality of who he is, I think they were with the crowd there at the feeding. So Jesus firmly establishes divinity here in this account, both to his disciples, to all the peoples of the day in pretty dramatic fashion. So how about the people, the crowds, do they get it? Go ahead, Matthew 33. Matthew 14, 33. Okay. It says, and those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, you are certainly a son of worship. And not having the power to cast him out, they were certainly not cast him out. Yeah. All right. Verse 22. The next day, the multitude that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the multitude therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they got into boats, they went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus says, well, I walked on water. I got here last night. No, Jesus cuts to the chase, right? Cuts right to the real question. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. It's not even for the miracles that you're following me. It's because you had your bellies filled. Do not work for the food which perish perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you, for on him the Father, even God, has set his seal. So, this harkens back to the woman at the well. Multiple other stories of Jesus. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. 
And then there's this title that he drops again, the Son of Man. And on the Son of Man, God has set his seal. And the seal is a, it was a stamp of approval. It was an, a stamp of verification. Um, I think here, too, it could be referring to the miracle that he just did, which is, hey, you just saw a miracle. That is God's stamp on me because you know and I know that no one else can do this. Remember back in chapter 5, 536, he says, Jesus says that his works testify of him that the Father has sent him. His work. So he definitely sets his uh, seal or himself up as sealed of the Father. And then there's Isaiah 42, 1, though. It says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nation. So this claim of being both the Son of Man and to have the seal of the Father on him, to the initiated, both crystal clear claims of messiahship, of divineness. Remember the Son of Man from Daniel 7, who is set up as Yahweh in the same scene as Yahweh. So again, th those titles aren't just dropped there randomly, if you will. So he says, don't work for food which perishes. And they say, okay, we don't want to do that. We want to do the works of God. What shall we do that we may do the works of God? What do we do? They want something they can grasp, right? Something they can sink their teeth into, something they can show their kids. This is what we've done, right? This is, this is natural religion. It's what we all try to do. It's what our tendency is to try to do to please God. We want to do things. We want to do things. We want to make ourselves righteous and acceptable. God, what can I do to make you happy with me? Look at what's, what's the largest natural religion in the world. It's causing lots of problems. Islam, right? Very naturally minded religion. Do these things and you will please God. Do, do, do. And sets it up as achievable, right? And yet strings you along because you never quite achieve. You never, you never feel like, oh, now I'm right with God. And if you ask a Muslim, they don't know that they're going to heaven, right? If they co commit jihad, they can go straight to heaven. But otherwise, they don't know if they've been good enough to go to heaven. What's the second biggest natural religion? in the world. It's the other big religion. I'm going to say Christianity. I'm going to say Christianity because, because many, many people in Christianity are striving and seeking day in and day out to be pleasing to God and they have failed to understand the gospel in the meantime. And we'll get to that more a little, in a little bit here. All right, so they want to do something to please God. And Jesus says, this is the work of God that you believe in who he sent. How easy is that? It's belief. But you have to do something, right? You have to do the work of God. It's belief. Believe in him who he has sent. And they, they, then they say to him, do something for us then. What can you do for us to prove that you're the son of God? As if they didn't just come the day before, right? Were they not there the day before? When he fed 5,000 men out of a single basket? 
They want another sign. What are they really looking for here? Another free meal, right? That's what Jesus accuses them of. You're here not even for miracles. You're here because you want another free meal. And to prove it, they go on in verse 31. Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread to eat out of heaven. Who's he that they're referring to there? It is. It's Moses. That's another just mind-boggling absurdity, right? They have, they have elevated Moses as the one who gave them the food. Hence, back in verse 14, they're likening this prophet as unto Moses, who gives us food. How, I mean, it, it does, it boggles my mind how badly they don't get it. And not only that, but they've elevated Moses in the position of God. And Jesus has to correct them in verse 32. Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who right now gives you the true bread out of heaven. The bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Therefore they said to him, Lord, give us this bread forever. We want this bread that satisfies forever. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Could he be more clear? I'm, I feel like he's being clear, but their hearts are hardened. They don't want to believe. He goes on in verses we're not going to get to today. They, they say, isn't this Mary and Joseph's son? How can he say he, come, he has come down out of heaven? And that would be hard, right? That would be hard. If, my, if Ben Seitzma, who grew up in this church, right, he's been around, and he says, I came down from heaven, I'm the bread of life. That would be challenging for us to believe, right? They might believe him over in Purim, but here, that would be really hard to believe. You guys grew up with Ben, that's part of the challenge here, but in spite of the obvious, in spite of his works, remember chapter 5, in spite of his works, in spite of John the Baptist's testimony, in spite of the testimony of Scripture, they do not want to believe that Jesus is for sure what he said he is. Sorry. They don't want to believe, they believe he's the Messiah, potentially, right? But they don't want to believe that he's the Messiah that the scriptures talked about. They want to believe that he's the Messiah who's going to reign and save them. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You know, bread, food, it's required for life. It gives us nourishment. It gives us healing. It gives us strength. But Food's also necessary for a more abundant life even than that, right? Food brings satisfaction of desire. When I'm really hungry, well, actually, I live in America. I'm never really hungry. But I desire ice cream a lot. <laughs> okay, food, and, and, what sa and a potato and steak does not satisfy my desire for ice cream. Food brings satisfaction and satiation of desire, and it brings pleasure. I think we can all attest to the fact that food is fun, right? We enjoy eating food. Now, if you're a vegan, you don't enjoy eating food, but <laughs> if you're anything else, you enjoy eating food, and food Food gives us community. Food gives us community. Who here eats alone for every meal? No. What? I mean, 
one of the most desirable things that we at least esteem in our minds is sitting down with other people and enjoying food. And Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am all of that. It's time to think about starting to wrap it up. Jim. I mean, the disciples did. They were from. They, did. They, did. You're right. they were from Galilee. They were backwoods hicks. So, I mean, I get what you're saying, um, but that's not how Jesus sets it up in chapter five, right? He says, "Look, the evidence is overwhelming." Um, so, yeah, I'm not trying to beat up the people of the day or the disciples. Okay, it just is what it is. It's how it's portrayed for us in the text that in spite of all the evidence, nobody's getting it. Or they don't want to get it. Ben? I think that the reason we look at the response or the ignorance of the people is because we see ourselves there. Yeah. I mean, and it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you grew up in this church or if you never set foot in the church. We see ourselves if we're looking on Absolutely. I mean, I am, I am convicted. Jesus stands before me and says, I am the bread of life. I am sustainment, nourishment, pleasure, satisfaction, community. But when, when life is hard... Or, or far too often, when life is hard, or even when life is good. You know, I find my nourishment in a little more food that I don't really need. And I find my healing in a vitamin, or healthy food, or working out. And I find, I find my strength in my strength what I can do with my own hands. I find my satisfaction in the fulfilling of my desires right now because I have them. Or I find my satisfaction in working towards my future desires. I don't really even live in the present all that much because I'm so worried about the future. And, in, and I do that instead of turning to Jesus, right? I need to consume Jesus. I need to consume Jesus. I need to turn to him for my satisfaction. I need to turn to him for community and pleasure. And he promises that he will fulfill all that beyond your wildest imaginations, so if I don't do that, do I really believe what Jesus says? So, and I want to close with this thought, though. Do not be deceived, friends. Go ahead. I've often wondered, God is the eternal God. What he'll do in the eternity's past and what he's going to do in the eternity's future. Yeah. God's going to satisfy our desire for eternity, for sure. So, but if you feel anything like I do, do not be deceived this morning. Okay? Salvation does not come today by saying, I am going to go out and I am going to, I am going to consume Jesus more. I am going to read more. I am going to pray more. 
I'm going to serve more. I'm going to give more. Because, see, the, the tentacles of natural religion reach right through those double doors and they're swirling around and they're looking for someone who wants to reach out and latch on to natural religion as a way to please God. And so when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, and we say, we need to consume Jesus, that does not mean that going out and trying to do that harder or better or bigger or longer, that does not mean that that is where salvation is. Okay, and you've heard the testimony of Ben, and you've heard the testimony of Andy, and you've heard my testimony where we sat in churches like this. And Andy's heart is softer than mine because I sat for another decade and a half before my heart was in a place to accept the fact that Jesus did a finished work for me, that I didn't have to fall and get up and try harder. I didn't have to strive and try and groan and struggle to please God. Because Jesus already knew when he died for me, that I wasn't going to love him like I'm supposed to love him, that I wasn't going to consume him as the bread of life like he deserves to be consumed. And he knew that, and he died for me anyway. He died for me anyway. He died for you anyway, even though this week, even though this next hour, you are going to fail to love Jesus like he deserves to be loved. You are going to fail to love other people like they deserve to be loved. And Jesus loves you anyway, and he did a complete work for you anyway. And if you haven't rested in that finished work, if you feel like you need to strive harder, try harder, consume more to achieve something that you can't even quite put your fingers on, then you have missed the gospel. You have missed the gospel and you are striving after natural religion. Okay, and on every Sunday morning, Natural religion is sitting right around you. So if you have experienced that, you sharpen your senses, okay? Start looking for it in your friends and your relatives because it's everywhere, folks. Christianity is the second biggest natural religion in the world because there's a bunch of people who think that they can follow all the moral teachings of Paul and somehow please God, and they haven't grasped the concept of the gospel. They have not rested in the concept of the gospel. I don't have any nice way to wrap it up. But Jesus walks on water. It's a clear claim of divinity. It's an absolutely necessary, back in that culture, it's an absolutely necessary thing to have done, to have conquered the sea. You know, and the, the disciples don't want to recognize him for the kind of Messiah that he's going to be. The people don't want to recognize him. They just want their bellies filled and, I mean, from here on out in the gospel, it just turns harder and harder against Jesus. But Jesus is the bread of life. Consume the bread. Consume the bread. Let's pray quick. Lord Jesus, thank you for your complete work. Thank you for your transformational power in our lives. And Lord, we fall so short of loving you for who you are. 
for worshiping you the way we should, for devoting our lives to you, woefully short. But Lord, you loved us anyway. You died for us. Thank you for that. Thank you for your free gift. The gift I couldn't earn if I tried. And Lord, because of that, I will worship you forever. Forever. For eternity. Upon eternity. I will worship you and glorify you because you have done things I could never come close to doing. Thank you for that. Lord, give us strength to love our neighbors, to love each other. Lord, help us see the opportunities. Give us the courage to seize them. Bless us as we go out this day. In Jesus' name, amen.